Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome to the Gardening Simplified Show. We are coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. I'm Stacey Hervella, and I am joined in studio by the one and only Rick Weiss, and of course, our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. And no, you are not imagining it. It is the beginning of this episode of Gardening Simplified, and we've switched roles a little bit because we have got breaking news. It's not branching news. It's breaking it news. It is true breaking news. It is. It's breaking news. Well, we're a little bit late, a little late on the uptake here because it did happen about a month ago, um, but it's the biggest news to hit horticulture since 2012, and that is that there is a new USDA hardiness zone map. I remember the turmoil it caused in 2002 and 2012 or somewhere yep. in that area. And here we go again. Yes. So um, there, there is a new map, if you haven't heard, and it has been everywhere. It is not causing nearly the consternation that the 2012 map caused. And, you know, looking into it a little bit more, um, I found some interesting um, history as to why the 2012 map caused so many problems. And that kind of leads into many of the changes that we're seeing here in the new 2023 map. So um, before 2012, there had not been a new USDA hardiness zone map since 1990. Wow. Yeah. So that was a long span of time. So nowadays, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, who administers these maps, along with the PRISM Working Group in Oregon, they use a bunch of weather data. Um, now they're committed to doing it roughly every 10 years to make sure everything is accurate. But at the time, no, they hadn't had a new map since 1990. So from 1990 to 2012, nothing new. And the 1990 map, which you know what everybody was kind of basing their horticultural decisions on, was based on data from 1974 to 1986. A lot has changed since. A lot has changed. And so what ha what was happening, of course, if you are old enough to remember the late 1970s, and I was very young in the <laughs> I remember the late 1970s, too. I was I'm very little. <laughs> I was, I, you know, at the age where I would be, like, walking to school in the insanely freezing cold and heavy <laughs> snow. And I remember, you know, snow days galore. So we had some unusually cold winters in the late 1970s. So all of that time span from 1990 to 2012, those really unusually cold years in the 1970s were kind of just dragging down everybody's hardiness zone because it kind of skewed the data much colder. And so when they decided to introduce the new map in 2012, they were using 30 years of data that took off those 1970s years, mm. and everybody freaked out in 2012 mm. because it looked like they skyrocketed up in their zones when, in fact, all they did was just sort of change the view of the data that they were looking at. They just shifted it to more recent data. So, Stacy, we're talking about the USDA hardiness zone map, and it's important to point out right at the top here, essentially what we're talking about is the average minimum temperature on an annual basis. Right? Yes. So that is, is what the USDA hardiness zone map is based on is the average minimum temperature. And this is actual air temperature. It's not wind chill that an area experiences. Uh, again, it's an average. Well, Stacy. so when we're talking about average minimum temperature, I watched a YouTube video where you explain the USDA hardiness zones. And I recommend to folks to go watch that video. It is a great explanation, Stacy, of why the USDA hardiness zone map is important to us. But within that video, you talked about the difference between Austin, Texas, and Portland. I've been both places, and yet on this map, they have the same average minimum temperature. Right. And so you're getting at probably my biggest pet peeve about the USDA hardiness zone map. Um, it's the only system we have. It's not a perfect system, but it is the only system sure. we have. So we have to use it now because it's only based on the lowest temperature. It's not that useful for our friends and numerous listeners in warm climates because it's Yes, cold is a very important measure of how, how a plant will survive, but so is heat. And so if you are living in a warmer climate, it's not really giving you any data to base that decision on. And, you know, like Rick said in this video, and of course put that in our show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, um, because it's based on the lowest minimum temperature, Austin, Texas, and Portland, Oregon are both considered USDA zone nine. 
But again, you don't have to, as you'll hear me say in the video, you don't have to have visited either of those places. But certainly if you have, you will know how different those climates are. And if it's just based on how cold they get, so they're equally as cold, but they certainly aren't equally as warm. Um, They certainly aren't equal in the amount of time that they have their very hot weather. You know, if in Austin, you're going to have well over 100 days of 86 degree plus temperatures. Whereas in Portland, Oregon, you know, you're probably going to have, you know, 10 to 20 at most. Sure. So sure. it's 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 the only system we have, but it really doesn't give us the full picture of what we can grow and how it will survive. And if you try to grow something that's thriving in Austin, in Portland, because you're just looking at that zone nine designation, it's not going to give you great success. And that's that's a problem for gardeners. And I think, well, that's where people like you and I come in, Rick. Mm-hmm. It's also where um, things like your local garden center really are important. And it's one of the reasons I think is so important, especially if you are a beginning gardener, to shop locally. Because you know, not only are they experts in what will grow, but they're generally stocking, especially in the perennials, shrubs, shrubs and tree section, they're only stocking plants that will actually grow in that area. Because they don't want you to be unhappy and, and you know, come back and complain. Right, exactly. And so I typed in my zip code and I moved from a 6A to a 6B. Yep. So here on the Lakeshore, we're now 6B. And within your video, and again, I recommend you watch this video because Stacy does such a great job with it. Um, it really doesn't have that much of an impact on the plants or the plants that you can put in the ground. But Stacy, psychologically, for me, <laughs> It has a bit, yeah. it has people impact. Yeah, because you're a little bit closer to zone seven, right? I'm a little more daring. <laughs> so, you know, I'm glad you brought up the A and B thing because that's another really interesting thing that came out starting in the 2012 map. And the reason that, so the hardiness zones are divided in 10 degree temperature and 10 degree Fahrenheit temperature increments. So the difference between zone six is 10 degrees colder than USDA zone seven. But in the 2012 map, they introduced these A and B hardiness zones. And the reason that they did that is because the 2012 map was the first one that was uh, based on geo-informational technology. So they were able to get so much more detail on where temperatures were being recorded and observed. And that is why they were able to get to that more granular level of an A and B within a hardiness Mm -hmm. zone. So that started in 2012. And of course it's continuing now. And so there's a five degree difference between the A and B part of a zone. So it's kind of like the halfway point between the 10 degrees between each zone. So with more data, better data, within your video, you also point out there were more stations? Yes. There's there's better data now. Yes, much more data. So more specific because they're using different um, geographical mapping systems to, to map that data to our actual geography. And the 2023 map is based on data from almost double the number of weather wow. stations that there were in the 2012 map. Okay. So, you know, I think people really freaked out with the 2012 map because there was such a huge difference from where they had been, but that map was essentially antiquated. So now here we are with the 2023 map. Differences are mostly subtle. People have either stayed the same or like us, gone up half a zone. And another thing that I say in the uh, video Um, which is so important for people to understand is just because your hardiness zone may have changed, it doesn't change the hardiness of the plants themselves. Right. Um, So that system is still the same. Basically the key that everything is, the plants are tested against, that's the same. So you can just kind of look at that and maybe now experiment with growing something a little bit hardier. But, you know, I think that gardeners have who really like plants, they tend to take a more experimental approach anyway. And say, I know I do. And I was excited. I was ready to plant bougainvillea and oleander here in Michigan. <laughs> well, now that might be a little bit of a stretch. Now <laughs> you're talking about zone nine, zone I 10 stuff, <laughs> but certainly, you know, I've had success with zone seven stuff. Uh, we had a question the other week about figs, which I've grown very successfully here in my backyard. Um, so again, it doesn't tell us the whole story. It gives us a starting point for understanding what we can grow And then with that starting point, we can start as gardeners to uh, consider what are the conditions in our yard? Do we have snow coverage? When it gets to that lowest minimum temperature, how long does that last? Um, All of these other factors, which again, the USD hardiness zone map doesn't cover, but that's sort of the art 
of gardening. It kind of the, the USD Hardiness Own Map gives us the science of gardening. And then all of that art stuff really comes from you and your lived experience as a gardener. And so again, it's just a guideline. It's just a suggestion. And how risk averse you are. That is a that's a very good point. I know as gardeners, we I tend to be more risk positive, you as well. Um, but there's lots more to learn about the USD Hardiness Zone system. Do check it out. We're going to put links uh, on our show notes so that you can find out what your hardiness zone is actually has is if it's changed or not and you can let us know on the comments on our youtube and while you're there check out our video on the usda hardiness zones so listen we're going to take a little bit of a break and when we come back rick has got plants on trial so please stay tuned Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show, coming to you from Studio A here at Beautiful Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. It's time for plants on trial, and Stacy's given me the keys to the car. Oh boy, we swapped cars today. <laughs> we did, <laughs> and I get to pick a plant, and the plant, of course, I'm going to pick is Blue Diddly Chase Tree Vitex Agnus Castus, which is a mouthful, but. It is one of my favorite plants, and one of the reasons that I love Vitex and Blue Diddly is the fact that in summer, to me, I'm not saying to you, I think to some other people it would, it smells like Vicks VapoRub. And that causes me to think back on my childhood days. As a matter of fact, mom would fix everything with four things, Vicks VapoRub, baking soda, saltine crackers, and ginger ale. Oh. Those were the four go-to things. And even today, I love ginger ale. I love a drink like Verner's. And when I drink it, people look at me and say, what's wrong with you? Do you feel sick? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I enjoy it. But that aroma of Vicks VapoRub on this plant. But beautiful flowers, attracts pollinators. So the plant of the day, the plant on trial, is Blue Diddly Chased Tree Vitex Agnes Castus. So just remember Blue Diddly. Now, I'm going to assume, Stacy, that the name of the plant is derived from the famous guitarist Bo Diddley. And uh, assuming that, I looked it up. His real name was Otha Ellis Bates or Elias Otha Bates. So I can see why his friends picked Bo Diddley. Good choice. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is named for, for Bo Diddley and also because the flowers are blue. Oh, and okay. uh, because Vitex blooms later in the season, when people are in the garden center in spring, most people are shopping then, they wouldn't see the flowers. Right. So we really wanted to get that term blue in oh, there okay. so that people would, see, you know, when it's, just, it's still an attractive plant when it's not in flower. It has very, very handsome foliage. But, you know, people don't necessarily have the confidence to say, oh, you know, I'm sure this is going to look amazing in August, which is, you know, when it blooms for us. So it was that. Now, I will confess I strongly wanted to call this plant Ain't Misbehaving. I want to hear this story. Yeah, and so, well, I love the artist Fats Waller. He is just one of my all-time favorite singers um, in the entire world, and he is the one who originally did Ain't Misbehaving, and then Louis Armstrong famously uh, covered it. Right. But, uh, so, I, I love the song, and Chaste Tree, of course, does refer to chastity, and I kind of liked that little play on words. It's memorable, it's cute, but I, that is one I lost. Still a little bitter about it. Still try to suggest it now and then for certain plants. Um, but uh, but blue diddly it is. And that, you know, like I said, for the reason of it not typically blooming when people are in the garden center, I can see it. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So Vitex is known as chaste tree or to be chaste. And uh, there's a lot of different roads that I could go down here. And I'm not going to do it because this show is rated G for general audiences, actually rated G for gardening. <laughs> yes. So I won't go down that road. However, the seeds or the fruit pods were used by monks to put out the fire, fulfill their <laughs> vows of chastity. I mean, I'm not going to go any further than that. Am I correct? That, that is the legend. Whether it was effective, I could not say. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. One of the reasons for talking about Vitex today and Blue Diddly is that we're talking about hardiness zones. Yes, great and when example. I, yeah, and when I first got into the industry, we viewed uh, Vitex as a solidly zone six plant. Now, I looked at the Gardening Simplified catalog, and it's listed USDA 6 but then behind that, in parentheses, it has 5B. 
Why the parentheses? So basically what we use that to indicate, and we aren't the only company that does this. You'll see this on other plants as well, to indicate that it will be okay in zone 5B with in a more protected area or if you are able to protect it. So okay. it's probably hardy, but it's not going to be one of those plants that you can just set in the ground and just, you know, hope it, it does okay. If you're in a colder area, you're just going to want to be a little bit more deliberate about where you plant it, uh, maybe in a more protected spot. Certainly it's going to need good drainage, which yes. is a huge part of this. Um, really anywhere that you can be successful with butterfly bush, you will be successful with Vitex as well. But you're right. I mean, it's a very well-known, very common plant in the South. And, um, I, for years, we would have people writing us and saying, oh, I was just visiting, you know, family and wherever, and I saw this plant, and it kind of looked like a butterfly bush, but the foliage was a little bit different. Can I grow that? The foliage looks like marijuana. That I know, many, many a person has mistaken it. Does. It. it It is just it, because it is palmately compounds, yeah. so it's shaped kind of like a you hand. You said it better than I did. <laughs> which, speaking of which, by the way, I said parenthesis. No, parentheses. Yeah. Is that right, or do you say parenthesis? I think I would say parentheses. Okay, because I said data. It's, it's and a you whole set. <laughs> I said data and you said data. Well, you know, Let's tomato, tomato. Call the whole thing <laughs> off. <laughs> Anyhow, hopefully our viewing and listening audience gets the idea here. Yeah. And so my point was, if we're talking about hardiness zones, I love Vitex and I love the aroma. We've already established that. But... In zones where maybe it's marginally hardy, I approach it almost similar to another favorite for pollinators of mine, and that is caryopters. Mm -hmm. So the concept or the idea here, Stacy, is I want people to understand, I live right on the lakeshore of Lake Michigan, and we moved from 6A to 6B with this new map. But prior to that, I was more inland, definitely zone 5, and so plants like a favorite of mine, caryopters or vitex, I would plant them, or let's, let's talk about a perennial. Crocosmia. Mm -hmm. I think in most catalogs it'd be listed as a zone six, but I planted it anyhow and mulched it heavily. With the woody type shrubs, I'd get a lot of dieback and I almost treated them as a herbaceous perennial. And as long as I was doing what Vitex likes, and you mentioned it, Stacy, good drainage, we get into the hot weather, that's when it really comes out. I consider it a pretty good drought tolerant plant. Oh, it's very drought tolerant. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so that approach, taking a woody shrub and almost treating it like it's herbaceous, no different than Budlea. Mm -hmm. Some winters are worse than others. Am I correct? In you're, that? you're absolutely correct. And and so these are plants that basically the plant will live. It's coming back from the roots. The actual woody growth that it's creating, like an, in a hard, a regularly hardy shrub, the the wood would persist and the growth would come from that wood. In these plants, which may die back in colder areas, the wood actually completely dies, but they are able to grow back from the roots. Another okay. good example of this is um, a lot of the crepe myrtles, like astromias, yeah. do yeah. something similar, you know, in our climate. They might die back, but then again, they might not. It really just depends on the kind of winter we have, how much snow cover we, we get, and of course, how long those really cold periods of weather last. If it's if it just barely dips down to those extreme colds and then comes right back up, that's fine. If it stays cold for three days, then you might have a problem. But you know, it's I think that that you really just said it by taking that initiative and saying, you know what, these are cool plants and I want to grow them. Yeah. Then that was you know all you're amazing your friends and neighbors and you're amazing yourself and that to me is the real joy of gardening is kind of taking those risks and and seeing what happens and in your case your reward was a fabulous Vitex that smells like Vicks Vapo Rub. I surprise myself all the time. <laughs> yes, exactly. It smells like Vicks Vapo Rub. Now so. I never noticed that until you said that, but you've mentioned it to us well, several times. Vicks Vapo Rub was originally known as Richardson's Croup and Pneumonia Cure Salve, and wow, they it rolls off the tongue. Yeah, and they couldn't fit it on the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a brother-in-law or a relative whose name was Vix, and so they went with Vix. This is the same guy in his marketing savvy, savvy that uh, invented Vix Tar Heel Sarsaparilla and Vix Yellow Pine Tar Cough Syrup. Oh, wow. He had a, like a little empire of, of cold medicines. But I love the aroma of Vix Vaporum. And, and that product really wasn't selling well until the pandemic, Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, mm. And that's when it started just flying off the shelves, and that's when it it's was burnt. household name so ever since. Interesting. If you work for Vicks Vapor Rub and you want to send me royalties, 
Message me. But I don't think it's made with Vitex. <laughs> no. No, it's just vi- it has a similar kind of uh, aroma. Actually, if you want that aroma, Plectranthus mm. uh, tomentosa. Yeah, Plectranthus, definitely. Yeah. Those have a great smell. Anyhow, that's my shot at Plants <laughs> on Trial. Whether good or bad, we did it, and I recommend you plant Blue Diddly Vitex. And if you still have no idea what we're talking about, check us out at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com or on our Instagram page or, of course, YouTube. You'll see the pictures of it. And if you have a full sunspot in your yard, it's deer resistant. It's a great choice to amaze all your friends and neighbors. Couldn't have said it better. Stacy and I will dive into the mailbag coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, one of the ways we love to simplify gardening for you is by answering your gardening questions. You betcha. And no matter what time of the year it is, you're always wondering about something, an indoor plant, an outdoor plant, and we are here to help. So if you have a question, you can reach us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or leave a comment on our YouTube, or leave a comment on our Instagram. There's lots of ways to reach us with your gardening Questions. So many choices. Yes. So we do the best we can to get back to people. And I know this question from Ryan is our first question. And he, I have had this one on the list for quite some time. So uh, what's Ryan asking? Well, Ryan asks us, hi there, longtime listener, first time asker. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for asking. I bought this little seedling of a paper bark maple. Yeah, Ryan, one of my favorite. Such a fab plant. F- oh, fabulous plants. And fortunate for us, Stacy's seated next to me so I can ask her, Acer Grissium? Grissium, yep. Mm -hmm. Nice one. I'm hot today. (laughs) Anyhow, paperback maple, a couple of years back, noticed it was sending up a single leader. I was holding for a multi-stem tree to really show off its legs if you know what I mean. Oh, I love that, Ryan. We always had that saying in the garden center industry. Sometimes you got to show a little leg, okay? That's great. So I cut it right down. To my surprise, this year it only sent out a single shoot to one side, not the multiple stems. How the heck do you signal this tree into sending up multiple stems from the base? Love you guys, and thank you. We love you too, Ryan. Wow. Well, so Yeah, so it's a great question, and I have to confess, I don't necessarily have a great answer. Oh, boy, Um, we're in trouble now. (laughs) But Ryan did send pictures, and of course, we'll put those. They're going to be in the YouTube video, and we'll put them on the show notes as well. Um, It's kind of a difficult question to answer. So the first thing that I want to say, Acer grissium is an absolutely beautiful plant called paperbark maple. It has this rich cinnamon-colored bark that peels when it's mature, and it's a trip a tri-leaf maple, so it's got palmate uh, compound leaves, just a very interesting interesting and beautiful plant beautifully sighted backlit so the sun comes through mm-hmm. that peeling bark one of my absolute favorites and birds love it i found every time i had a paper bark mer- uh, maple the birds just loved being in that tree oh, for cover so win-win yeah. um but it is a very slow growing plant and so one thing i want to first caution you against ryan or anyone growing this is they are sometimes grafted so what that means is that the paper bark maple would have been grafted onto a different maple mm-hmm. to increase its growth rate because uh, the you can graft it onto a base of a plant that's faster growing and that will help the top grow more quickly. So it's hard to tell for sure, uh, obviously without seeing the plant, if it is grafted. I would first of all, before you do anything else, carefully look at the base to see if you see any difference between you know a line where it might have been grafted or a difference between the lower wood and the upper wood. Because if your plant was grafted, you definitely do not want to be cutting it back hard because that would mean that your understock or, you know, roots are going to take over and that is not going to be nearly as interesting Won't be pretty. as the paper bar. I don't know what it is, but it's probably <laughs> not going to be as interesting as the paper bark maple. So with that in mind, um, you know, as you'll see, if you look at the pictures, um, Ryan's plant is, is fairly small going along with this being a slow growing plant. And so my recommendation here, you know, plants have this concept of apical dominance. They want to just grow up, 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 unless something changes. And so basically what happens is that upper bud is a hormone factory that produces these hormones that stifle the growth of everything below it. So, you know, Ryan, by cutting it back, you tried to release more growth, but it just wasn't quite enough. So um, all it did was put out this one shoot. So my suggestion, if indeed it's not grafted, is to go back to what we were talking about with coppicing in the last episode. And with coppicing, where you're cutting something back to get multiple stems, 
the uh, roots of a mature plant act as an engine to fuel that growth. Now, I think that your plant is still pretty young and small. And so that engine, so to speak, is not fueling enough growth yet for the plant to respond to being pruned. What you did is indeed the correct thing to do to try to get a multi-stemmed habit. Um, but I think that the roots just need a little bit more time to develop into a more robust root system to hopefully fuel more growth coming back so that you get those multiple stems emerging. You know, this idea of a multiple stem versus a single stem tree, whether it's for a birch or a maple or um, even crab apples, those multi-stem versus single stem, they kind of fade in and out of style. Um, I know once I went to a lecture on the crab apple trees in Central Park and they were trying to restore some of them and no one produced apple trees like they did back in the early 1900s sure. um, where they were known for having these low branching multiple stems. And so some of that pruning technique just gets lost, but that's a great thing about gardening. We can take it on ourselves, but I do think you need a bigger root mass before you do that cutting back to see the results that you want. Yeah, and you know, Stacy mentioned apical dominance. Uh, so you have that terminal bud and plants produce a growth hormone that tends to go to the terminal bud. If you cut back on it, forces outward growth or new growth, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And that's the concept here. By the way, that's part of the reason I love June berries the way I do, because you can get June berries in those multi-stems and I They're I so pretty that, that way. They're so pretty. Uh, so I would agree. I think, uh, I think you nailed it, uh, uh, Stacy. And, and I would, I'd let the plant establish and, and try again. And I think you should be able to get the multi steps. Yeah, again, just, just look out for that grafting. <laughs> Lee is wondering, I have two long hedges of hydrangea paniculata facing the south and north facing sides of our home. Some of the shrubs are starting to take on a tree shape instead of a hedge. Oh, we're, so we're getting the opposite <laughs> here. Uh, can it be from the way I'm pruning them in spring, I've attached a photo of one of the firelight hydrangeas to illustrate my issue. So it looks like we're looking at firelight and limelight. Yes. And okay. it could, this could happen with really any panicle hydrangeas. And um, this is another one. I don't have like a super good explanation for as to why this happens. I call it broomstick growth. And I've seen it here in our trial gardens multiple times. Um, for whatever reason, a panicle hydrangea will just send up these super strong, super rigid pin straight shoots right out of the center. And that is the quality that gives them the ability to be trained as a standard or tree form hydrangea, which people of course love, right. but sometimes it does it. And I don't really know why it very well could be related to pruning kind of going back again to this concept of the root mass functioning as an engine to fuel growth. So if you're pruning something really hard and it has a big root mass fueling all that growth, it's going to respond by putting that energy into, you know, big thick shoots like that. So um, I would recommend uh, if you don't want that, that you prune those out, just get your loppers and prune them out at the base. Don't let them get too large. If they are large, I would just go ahead and cut them back by about half to get more branching within the plant. But this is just uh, sort of, I think, a strange quality that panicle hydrangeas tend to have. Um, and, you know, again, it might be related to pruning and kind of the way the energy gets concentrated through the plant. But I've also just seen it happen and it just, it's just one of those things. Lee, hang in there. And as Stacy said, it's not your fault. So at least you feel better. <laughs> right. Debbie writes to us, I have deer, but I'm determined to have hydrangeas. Yes, Debbie, way to go. They have made it through the summer and their colors have been stunning. Should I continue to spray them with liquid fence during the winter months? Debbie, I think you should do the same thing I did. And that is uh, I built a compound, put up signs that say no deer allowed and that type of thing. So far, it's working for them. <laughs> they, they've read the signs they and they're the staying signs. away. Good. Yeah, deer can read. It's very polite of them. Thank you. Um, well, the good news, and Debbie included pictures of her hydrangeas hydrangeas and the hydrangeas in the pictures are smooth hydrangeas, hydrangea yes. arborescens. So this type blooms on new wood. In other words, it's not going to make any flowers for 2024 until uh, it starts growing in 2024. Mm -hmm. Now that you can compare that to an old wood hydrangea, an old wood blooming hydrangea, which if it were an old wood blooming like hydrangea macrophylla or oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea quercifolia, um, those would have their flower buds for 
2024 right now. In that case, it would be absolutely imperative to spray them and make sure the deer didn't eat the, the buds because then your, your plant wouldn't flower. Mm -hmm. Since you have a new wood blooming, it's not as important to spray them now because even if they eat the plant back, they're basically just kind of doing your pruning for you that you would Correct. normally do in the spring. They're not harming the plant's ability to set flower buds, which of course is the whole reason that we grow hydrangeas. But I would say that, um, you know, deer do love hydrangeas. The growth is very tender and delicious, apparently, to them. Uh, and I would say if you want your plants to grow fast and look their best, I would consider spraying them to just minimize the damage. Because I have tried to grow hydrangea arborescence in my yard, and they have literally eaten them to nubs. Mm. So the plant can come back, but I mean, just so little left. And if you look at Debbie's photos, which we'll have again in the show notes and on YouTube, you'll see that they are a pretty important part of our landscape. Um, so I would say definitely spray them. You don't have to be as rigorous as you would if you were trying to preserve flower buds. Correct. With uh, a smooth hydrangea. And, you know, go back a couple of shows when we talked about Cape Cod and the polar vortex yep. and how big leaf hydrangeas were decimated, but the smooth hydrangeas on Cape Cod this past summer were gorgeous. We're, yeah, looking good. Yeah. Um, but definitely you're going to want to start look being real careful about your spraying in early spring because that's when they're really hungry and that's when the plant's going to start growing and that's when they can experience the most setback. So you can take it a little easy in winter if you want, but definitely mark your calendar for that early March time frame and start mixing up the spray. So thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, we're going to take a little break. When we come back, Rick has branching news, so please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show. It's time for branching news. Not breaking news, but we don't make this stuff up. Ready, set, glow. Uh-oh, the national Christmas tree fell over. Don't look now. Well, actually, it was uh, Tuesday, November 28. High winds and gusts caused the tree to, uh, to fall over. So they had to stand the thing back up in order to light it. At least a Christmas tree looks best when it's standing upright. And, uh, and so they did that. But the reason I bring this up in, in branching news, Stacy, is that the previous tree, which was planted in 2021, was removed because it developed needle cast, which is a fungal disease that causes needles to turn brown and fall off. Also not a good thing for your Christmas no. tree. You'll have a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Uh, I found that uh, fascinating. And I think they're looking uh, to plant one again. But in this case, they stood one up because the previous tree was afflicted by needle cast. And we see that on spruce trees uh, yeah, quite it's, often. It's very common. Yeah. So they, you know, they are very susceptible to a number of diseases and not least of all, because they had a real heyday in the 1970s and 80s and oh just were word. completely overplanted. Everybody planted. Everybody planted. It's like uh, ornamental pear, same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, right. and so when you have a huge mass of plants like that, the deep disease can spread easily. That's right. That's why we always um, preach diversity on the show. Also, I think it's important. Uh, this from Michigan, Lanesburg, Michigan, deer feasting on pines and spruce means the holiday tradition of cutting down a Christmas tree gets the ax this year at a tree farm in Michigan. Uh, I bring this up because it's just sad for me and I feel bad for these owners. Um, there's a video and the owner shows where he says from here up, Tree ain't too bad, but down there it's it's ruined. And boy, do I feel your pain. So he's basically saying that the deer population has gotten so heavy, uh, there's less hunters, uh, that he's having real problems with his uh, with his tree farm. That's that is interesting because typically I don't think of deer as eating much spruce and fir. They're not right. not super high on their list, but of course in a Christmas tree environment. The trees are frequently being trimmed, putting out a lot of succulent growth, and that does change things for there deer. You go. They do like new growth more than old growth, so it might not be an issue for someone with a spruce or a fir in their yard, but in an agricultural environment, different story. Oh, it just makes me sad. Makes it me, is. you know, I get melancholy at this time of the year, and I want to just pour a glass of wine, put a Dean Martin record on and listen to it. And that's kind of what this story does to me. I mean, the owner says here, down the drain. 12 years of mowing oh. and spraying and pruning, and the deer did it. Oh, that's really a shame. Oh, dear. It's tough to make a buck. 
All right. How are Americans being echo conscious this holiday season? I don't know how many people think about being echo conscious during the holiday season, uh, but I thought this survey was great. We're going to post it at the website, gardening simplified on air.com. Check it out in our notes. Uh, so the way people do it is to reuse decorations from previous years. That makes sense. Use re reusable dishes, avoid overconsumption on black Friday and cyber Monday. Coordinate with other guests so you don't have too much food and you got to put them in those cool whip containers. Make homemade gifts. Buy more locally sourced ingredients. Compost your food scraps. Uh, offset any holiday travel. Serve more meatless options. So kind of an interesting, uh, kind of an interesting survey. I, for me, being echo conscious, I like to buy ornaments when they're 50% off or 75% off and then donate the old ones to somebody who can use them. See, in my family, we've always had like ornaments that we have every year. We've never had like the stylish Christmas tree that's mm -hmm. like going with whatever kind of trend. It's always been like, oh yeah, this is, you know, the ornament I made in brownies in fourth grade and it's still going up there on the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because this year I uh, had Max decorate the tree and uh, all the ornaments are on one side of the tree and I love it. <laughs> Uh, beautiful. All right. We'd need to talk. A giant tumbleweed, roughly the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, was spotted hurtling its way down a four-lane road in California. This was posted in social media. A lot of people picked up on this, um, and it was on X, which I still call Twitter, but whatever. The jaunty brown bundle of brush was captured on video and posted on November 21, and it is quite uh, quite a sight to see this tumbleweed as big as a car rolling down the highway. Wow. Amazing. You know, tumbleweeds are kind of like this iconic symbol of the West, but people who live around them, they can be a real problem. They can. They can pile up on porches and they're not as easy to remove as leaves. It's not a, a problem we have to deal with here in Michigan, but uh, <laughs> you start looking that stuff up and I do not envy them. No, not at all. They fall under an umbrella of noxious weeds that when dry break off at the root, setting off a seed spreading expedition. That's what they're doing as they tumble out there. Now, here's this is interesting for me. I didn't know this. Uh, it is believed they've hitched a ride from Ukraine to South Dakota in a shipment of flaxseed back in the 1870s and has plagued the country's dare, uh, dry, arid lands ever since. Hmm. So I think that that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. That is interesting. And not all tumbleweeds are um, made the same. Uh, they, some grow more vigorously than others. So anyhow, uh, very interesting to watch. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's jump to a water park story here a minute and talk about drought. As long as we're talking about tumbleweed, uh, in this age of water wise gardening, check this out in Houston, slick city is the very first ever waterless water park in the state of Texas. How fun is that? Would you want to go to a waterless water park? Well, I mean, I assume you don't go hurtling down the slides into a dry pit or anything. I like think that. you do. 55,000 square feet with 11 awesome slides. We have different aerial attractions, zip lining swings, sport courts, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a different concept, unlike anything you've ever seen at an indoor slide park. A lot of us grew, grew up going to a water park. This is a water park without the sun. And without the water, it's a different concept. Yeah, that's a different concept. Well, and it's profitable year round. You can't argue with that compared to, you know, a water park you can only go to when it's nice enough to be outside. I can't wrap my <laughs> mind around Oops. a waterless water park, but I suppose, you know, it gets so dry and hot in yeah. Texas. Earlier we were talking, comparing Austin to Portland for average minimum temperature, but the other climate issues, uh, so, so very, uh, very different. So I don't know. It's so dry. How dry is it? Thank you. It's so <laughs> dry. They had to close two lanes at the public swimming pool. That's how dry it was. Well, it sounds like you need to take a little trip to Houston and check out the, uh, waterless water park and report back. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. Doesn't sound too comfortable to me, but I'm going to give it a try. Well, I looked at the pictures. People seemed like they were having a good time. That's good. That's good. I, I would think that that's important. 
Australia, for our final story here, Australia has too many sheep and farmers are giving them away for free. Australia's mutton glut has sent prices tumbling and some of the farmers are compelled to give their sheep away to save costs instead of rearing them on the farm. Wow. So driving the large sheep flock, and here's how it ties into gardening and and plants, because again, we often talk about drought. Driving the large sheep flock were three years of above average rainfall in Australia's sheep regions. So their flock has reached 78.75 million head, the largest since 2007, because it's been raining a, uh, raining a lot and the grass is growing. Hmm. I think that that's, uh, that's very interesting. So they're shearing the sheep with you, and they're not sheepish about their intentions. Don't be a bleeding heart. They'll find a good home. So are they giving them to other farmers or just to home to homeowners as, who anybody, want a, a pet sheep? Anybody who wants them. All right. Uh, interesting. I think it's a bad idea. Okay, that's it for today's show. Boy, we packed in a lot today. We sure did. Well, there's a lot to say, a lot going on. And I want to uh, remind you, and I'm sure Adriana Robinson will put the links there to Stacy's USDA Hardiness Zone map. Watch that. Uh, what a great explanation. And, of course, we got to expound on that today, too, and I enjoy doing that. Always a privilege and pleasure to do the show with you, Stacy. Likewise. Adriana Robinson, thank you so much for all you do. And most of all, thanks to you for tuning in watching the Gardening Simplified show. Visit our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Have a great week.